Hello, everyone. I think we should try to, to go ahead and, and get started uh, with our webinar today. My name is Ken Roberts, and I'm a professor in the government department at Cornell University. And I'd like to welcome you to the fifth webinar in our series, Democracy 2020, organized by the American Democracy Collaborative. We're living through a pivotal time in United States political history. The American Democracy Collaborative is a group of political scientists from Cornell, Johns Hopkins, and Swarthmore who've organized to try to help us understand the challenges that we face at this pivotal time in American history. Some of us specialize in the study of the United States, including the previous crises of democracies that we've faced. Others specialize in the study of, uh, of other parts of the world and study the, the challenges to democracies seen elsewhere around the world. And we've come together to, to try to examine the state of American democracy today. One of the fruits of our collaboration is a new book just published this year by two of our members, Suzanne Mettler and Robert Lieberman, entitled Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. We also have an edited volume that is in the works on polarization and democratic resilience that'll be published next year by Cambridge University Press. So you can read more about our projects at americandemocracycollaborative.org at our website. And we have information posted there as well about the final webinar in our 2020 series, which will be coming up on Friday, the, Friday December the 4th on post-election assessment, the future of American democracy. That'll be featuring Francis Lee from Princeton University, Christopher Parker from the University of Washington, and Paul Pearson from the University of California at Berkeley. So we're very appreciative to, to Cornell University for making the series possible. And in particular, we're thankful to the Ainaudi Center for International Studies and the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs for their support and their generosity. So with that said, let me now introduce today's panel, which is entitled Polarized Partisanship, Social Movements and the Transformation of American Democracy. And it'll be moderated by my colleague, Tom Papinski, who is a Tisch University fellow, fellow uh, uh, Tisch University professor, excuse me, in the Department of Governments at Cornell and a non-resident senior fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution. Tom studies the political economy of Southeast Asia and other emerging market economies, and does a lot of work on democratic governance in a comparative perspective. So with that said, I'll turn it on over to Tom now. Go ahead, Tom. Great, hi everybody. Uh, thanks to uh, Ken for the nice introduction uh, and to all of you uh, playing along at home for joining us for today's webinar. Um, as Ken mentioned, um, today's webinar is uh, entitled Polarized, uh, Partisanship, Social Movements, and the Transformation of American Democracy. We're going to be struggling and talking about questions uh, lying at the intersection of how we understand social movements in American politics and how they've affected the two major political parties, um, uh, both in, uh, uh, in the current years and thinking historically. Um, parties and movements, as we know, have long provided voice to citizens and that they've connected them to the government. But these mediating roles are in flux and their transformation has important implications for, it, for American democracy. So before I introduce our three panelists, I'd like to take a chance um, to invite you all, uh, those of you who are attending, uh, to use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom to submit your questions. Uh, we'll be moderating them, those questions behind the scenes, and then uh, they'll come to me, so I'll be able to ask them to our panelists after we've had a, uh, about 45 minutes of initial discussion. And I'd also invite you to tweet about uh, today's webinar using the hashtag, uh, hashtag democracy2020. Uh, um, so without further ado, I'll introduce just briefly our three panelists. Um, first of these uh, is uh, Julia Azari, who's an associate professor of political science at Marquette University. You may have seen her from uh, her really active engagement of public intellectual work um, at places like Mischiefs of Faction and elsewhere. Um, and she's a specialist uh, on topics such as the American presidency, communication and rhetoric and political parties. Joining us as well as Alex Hertel Fernandez, who's an associate professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University. Um, uh, his work, which has appeared both in um, academic publications and in places like New York Times and Washington Post, focuses on issues such as American political economy, business labor, and wealthy donors. And then 
Third, I'd like to introduce Leah wright Rigger, who's the Harry S. Truman Associate Professor of American History at Brandeis University. Um, she is the author of the award-winning book, The Loneliness of the Black Republican, Pragmatic Politics and the Pursuit of Power. Um, and her research and scholarship uh, addresses 20th century United States political and social history, modern African-American history, and an F with an emphasis on race and political ideology. So thanks to uh, Julia, Alex, and Leah for joining us. We'll start with a couple questions that are gonna be directed to all of our panelists. Um, there was a time when political scientists said the US had what we called two catch-all parties. These are parties that were very diverse, had heterogeneous uh, and broad social bases and a broad ide ideological profile, but which overlapped in the center of the political spectrum. So, one thing that we see in the modern era is that parties are much more diverse or much less diverse, much more polarized. So can we ask what has caused the parties to become so polarized, both in their platforms and in their social constituencies? And to what extent is partisan polarization driven in the cycles of social mobilization and counter mobilization that date back to the 1960s, both in the progressive uh, and in the uh, conservative sides. So I'll just go in the order of last names. So we'll start with Julia. Great, thanks Tom. And thanks so much for having me on this panel. So this is a great question. And I think there's a lot of possible answers to it. Um, as far as the as far as the, the mobilization of social movements, I see how this is this has played a role in um, in polarization and, and in particularly the kind of rise of the Christian right in the 1970s, informing the Republican Party and potentially transforming it into a different kind of party organization than we've seen in the past in the United States. So I think this is a question that scholars really began to grapple with maybe even 15 years ago during the George W. Bush administration about how is, how is the Republican Party kind of a distinct entity as a, as a political party. But I don't think that that's the only, I don't think that's the only question. Um, the other point at which I think we can identify the rise of polarization is of course this sort of sorting of the two parties around the issue of, of civil rights. And um, that's not unrelated to the rise of this kind of socially conservative and Christian conservative movement um, in the subsequent decade. But I think that's a really important moment that a lot of the literature on polarization identifies as kind of the moment when the two parties started to become more distinct um, and to focus on and be organized around a kind of central social issue rather than the, the economic axis of the, the New Deal Party coalition that allowed these more patchwork coalitions to, um, to survive. I think the, the, the underappreciated moment of polarization is more recent. And that's the middle of the, the George W. Bush administration. And I think that there, you know, there are a number of things we could identify in terms of why at some point, at some point in George W. Bush's first term, it seems that the electorate really started to meaningfully polarize. And so I think that that could lead us to theorize in a number of directions. One is the role of the, the president plays in polarization and the role of the president as a central symbolic figure has, you know, the role that that can play in creating more permanent and more kind of deeply symbolic and identity-based political fissures. Um, but I think the other underappreciated element of this is the way in which crisis, we, we think about crisis as creating a kind of rally effect um, that unifies the nation, but it seems, you know, those moments are short-lived and actually having an enduring crisis, whether it is a kind of permanent war on terror whether it is economic inequality and the long fallout of the Great Recession, uh, whether it's a public health crisis, I think we often underestimate the capacity of those crisis moments to create these, these deeper and long lasting divisions. So I have a, a lot of hypotheses. Um, I'm not totally sure which one is correct, but I do think that if we look to this more recent moment, we can get more purchase on the exact nature of our of our partisan polarization and think about that as part of a continuum with this longer process of, um, of civil rights and social movements. Excellent, thanks, Julia. We'll move next to Alex. 
Great, um, and thanks for the opportunity to participate in this panel and this great lineup of, of events. So I wanted to pick up on two things that you mentioned, Tom, and, and sort of think through how they've applied to polarization on the political right. Um, and one of them is thinking about polarization as a deliberately constructed process. So often we look at the trend of polarization in Congress or polarization in the public, um, and it's easy to think that this is just a a process that unfolds over time on its own. But polarization was really driven by concrete choices um, from the ground level, from um, mass organizations of social movements, and also from the elite level, from deliberate actors like donors, um, interest groups, advocacy organizations that were seeking to change the sort of things that parties stood for and the policies that those parties ended up pursuing. And in my work, I focused on elite level driven polarization of the Republican Party, starting in an earlier era, um, I think, th than, um, than Julia was just mentioning, in the 1960s and the 1970s, driven very much by a counter reaction to developments on the left. And during that moment of the 1970s, some business owners, ideological conservatives, donors who were at the felt like they were at the fringes of the Republican Party looked at the Democratic Party and saw the rise of labor unions, particularly teachers unions in the states that were helping to move the Democrats further to the ideological left. And they said, we need to get our act together. We need to have a conservative party that we can count on from, that delivers concrete wins on social issues, on economic issues, particularly thinking about control of the states. And so they invested in creating uh, an infrastructure that could push Republican office holders in particular, Democrats to some extent, but especially Republicans in a more rightward direction on, on, all, on all of these issues. And it took time, certainly. Um, it didn't happen overnight, but, um, but over time, these forces were successful in, in reorienting the party. And I think um, I might end with three strategies that they pursued um, that were especially effective that might be a helpful way of thinking about how other social movements have or have not managed to shape parties. And the first is that they helped fill out the content of what it meant to be um, a conservative Republican. That, that was a label that many state politicians might have identified with, but they didn't have concrete policy positions that necessarily were bundled together in that way. You know, maybe they knew they wanted less regulation, but what did that mean on the ground for the sort of legislation they would be pushing? These groups were successful to the extent that they were able to fill in that policy um, package for, for what went with um, uh, what went with this conservative viewpoint if you were a state lawmaker. Second, um, I think they were successful in knitting together coalitions of otherwise disparate groups on the right that might not have worked together by um, teaching them that it was in a co in their group interest and a common cause to be able to, um, to reorient the Republican party. And lastly, they really invested in career pipelines for the state legislators that they were working with, um, that they, they saw themselves as creating networks that would help these folks go on to run for governor, for Congress, um, even, um, even higher office. And so in this way, they managed to create a cadre of, of politicians within the party that carry these beliefs and ideas with them. Uh, next over to you, Leah. Yeah, so um, first, thank you for all for having me here today. And it's uh, really exciting to be here and talking about democracy in a moment of kind of democratic crisis, I would argue, and perhaps we can get into that a bit later. Um, but I do want to echo a little bit of what Julia and, and Alex said and expand it a bit, where I think that we can root, we can actually push back a bit and, and root a lot of these ideas of polarization and partisanship in actually the 1960s, actually really the 1950s and 1960s, and thinking about some of the organizations and thinking about how some of these groups in the political parties make very conscious decisions about the directions and the constituents, the directions they wanna go in and the constituents that um, they are speaking to. And so the first one very quickly that I think um, is worth focusing on is thinking about the Democratic Party in the 1960s and the very conscious decision that they make in the aftermath of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to align themselves with Black voters and vice versa. So I'm thinking of, you know, a moment like um, uh, Bayard Rustin and writing, you know, how do we go from protest to politics? Well, we align ourselves with this organization that perhaps has not worked in our best interests, but is our best possible path towards getting economic, you know, equality, getting racial egalitarianism, and all of these other issues. Um, I also think about this moment where somebody like Fannie Lou Hamer is, you know, goes to the Democratic National Convention in 1964 and says, you know, you're nothing but a party full of, you know, uh, 
Barry Goldwater supporter is hiding, but then goes back to Mississippi and says, I have to work to produce, you know, a, a version of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that ultimately can oust, you know, racist Democrats and replace the entire infrastructure of the party system. And she's quite successful, right? And we can talk a little bit more about, you know, how that happens or why it happens, but it really does transform the party from, you know, from the very state level, uh, state local level to the national level. But I say the next part of this is that we see very conscious decision making from Republican elites, Republican leaders in the 1960s and into the 1970s to use that transformation within the Democratic Party as kind of a, as kind of a wedge issue amongst these different constituent groups. So, you know, I think about um, Richard Nixon and the ultimate passage of affirmative action, whereby affirmative action is used as a wedge issue to split the labor and, you know, essentially civil rights vote. But also that later it's used to, con uh, to really bring in white urban ethnics into, um, into Republican circles by virtue of the fact that they are denied, explicitly denied affirmative action benefits through these Republican um, elite circles, right? So that becomes a kind of tension point that actually benefits Republicans in the long run in terms of generating this kind of grievance politics, larger grievance politics that they use to their advantage. So I also want to think about how backlash politics and the rise of backlash politics, particularly in the 1960s, 1970s, and then in response to multi, uh, multiculturalism of the 1980s, ends up being a polarization point. Um, I would also point to um, something like the 1980 presidential election as a way of really signifying that when we talk about polarization, political polarization, we're also talking about racial polarization. So when we look at, say, the presidential election and we look at how the turnout, how, how what turnout is like, we see that the people that are divided aren't necessarily just divided along, you know, say, class lines or things like that, but it really is a racial division, right? A racial breakdown of support for political parties. And that has been persistent really over the last 50 to 60 years. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say here that I think is important for thinking about, particularly in some of the works that I've done on social movements and contemporary history on, on um, kind of red flags leading up to the 2016 election, is to think about the failure of democracy and the where, way in which party elites have really failed as political institutions to grant the things that their base has requested. Um, and so we see some of that play out, not only in say Occupy Wall Street, not only in the Tea Party movement, but also in the emergence of Black Lives Matter. And so what I think is really worth thinking about is the ways in which political parties, but especially the Republican Party, has used something like a movement like Black Lives Matter and its, you know, its pursuit of this idea of the illegitimacy of the state to actually reinvigorate white support for the Republican Party as a, and, and, and exemplify this kind of idea of not just political polarization, but racial polarization as well. Wonderful, thanks, Leah. And in fact, that uh, 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 takes me really nicely to the, the, the next question I was gonna ask you all, which is about Black Lives Matter in particular. And so instead of looking at the past, I want you to, in this next question, think about speculating a bit towards the future or what might ha be happening over the coming years. Uh, and we'll do this in reverse. So Leah will go first and then Alex and then Julia. Um, and so what I wanna, uh, what's striking to me is just how quickly um, the Democratic Party and most uh, most sort of middle class and suburban Americans have actually come to embrace Black Lives Matter. Of course, this is contested and not far from unanimous, but this is, we are very, we are very far away from the, the politics of only four years ago when, when Kaepernick taking a knee was a really divisive thing that was almost, you know, got him banned from playing football in the NFL. Uh, we no longer live with those politics right now. So looking forward, what happens to Black Lives Matter as a movement, formal or informal, if the Democrats actually go ahead and sweep the elections next week? Does this become, does Black Lives Matter really become a mainstream voice within the Democratic Party? Or is this going to be a site of contestation, which will then be, um, or a division between say more progressive uh, movement activists who have aggressive uh, plans for defunding the police versus those who are in favor of, um, you know, taking the, the worst of police brutality out of our politics, but would not go quite so far. Um, and I'll, I'll, start with, I'll start with Leah. How do you see this playing out in, in such a world? <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. So there's so much to say <laughs> on this answer in so little time. So the first thing that I'll start is that I think that there was a common consensus that the 2016 election had all but killed Black Lives Matter. And I think the, the deaths of George Floyd and the protests that arose in reaction to that globally kind of throws that idea out of the water um, and also reinforces the idea that there is this larger, this is a movement that is tremendously powerful, at least in um, at least in some, uh, on a symbolic level, right? So that, and that there is substance in that symbolism. With that said, I think there are a couple of different uh, different ways that BLM could turn out if we see a win from a Democratic candidate. Um, the first is to say that, you know, there's something to be said, and I, I, I think this is, you know, it comes out of like the Combahee River Collective. They say that there's a way in which liberal politics can absorb radical politics and then neutralize it, particularly through substantive, through um, kind of superficial efforts. And so I, one of the things that I would point out is that in this larger embrace of Black Lives Matter, there's been a push, a real push from democratic institutions, but also the democratic party to essentially water down the politics of Black Lives Matter. And so I actually see moving forward, a continued embrace of kind of surface level symbolism of Black Lives Matter. It We've moved from, in a, a two year period, we've moved from a party that had difficulty saying Black Lives Matter to everyone having kind of a full-throated embrace, being able to say that. But does that actually mean an em, em, embracing the actual politics that Black Lives Matter stands for? I don't know that that will actually happen. I think it's far more likely that they will embrace kind of the this, this surface level ideas of Black Lives Matter. And we see this a little bit in the presidential, can of Joe, uh, presidential campaign of Joe Biden, who has explicitly said, I will not defund the police, has also included in, um, you know, uh, an increase in police budgets as part of his agenda and his platform, which is very much you know, at odds with the current agenda of Black Lives Matter. Now, with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over, you know, turn it over to Alex in, in a second by say, by closing, by saying that there is an opportunity, however, particularly with Black Lives Matter in terms of moving within state and local organizations to transform the party in ways that actually mirror what Republicans did, Republican Tea Party activists and, um, did uh, in 2010 and 2012 and even in 2014. And so what we see, and I think part of this comes out of a Trump victory, which is that Black Lives Matter has to adjust as a kind of a national movement. And one of the ways that they adjust is by pouring their energy into state and local electoral races. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that increase and continue and that become the mechanism by which you force change in the upper echelons of a very resistant Democratic Party. Thank you, fascinating. Yay, federalism. Here's a, here's a <laughs> this may actually, uh into the Democrats' favor for a second. Um, let's turn it over to Alex. Great, thanks. And I think I'll pick up right where, where Leah left off and say, you know, I think there are three important outcomes to be looking for to think about the long-term effects of Black Lives Matters, uh, the, those protests, but also the, the broader movement moment that we're in. You know, I would po point to, for instance, the large-scale protests that happened in 2018 and 2019 around the teachers in red states protesting over educational disparities, low levels of education spending. I'd point to the Women's March and the resistance, uh, the resistance movement as well. I mean, over the past few years, we've just seen an enormous um, amount of energy that's been building on one another. Um, and the question in my mind is, um, you know, first, the extent to which these movements change attitudes and opinions on the ground. And I think we see some some evidence that that's certainly having an, uh, that Black Lives Matter is certainly having an effect. And I've done some work around the teacher strike showing that it has changed perceptions around, say, interest in the labor movement and support for, for labor unions. And so I think that's one concrete way that you could think about durable, um, durable effects of these movements over time. I'd say a second one is exactly what Leo was saying, the extent to which these movements think about trying to get a foothold within the party structure. When I think about recent social movements that have had great success at shifting political parties' stances, shifting 
the nominees that parties put forward and ultimately the candidates that are elected, I think about the Tea Party. Um, and as I think uh, Theda Scotchpole and Vanessa Williamson have shown really persuasively, you know, one of the reasons why the Tea Party was so successful is that they worked within the party to actively nominate candidates, to get on these local boards, these local party committees um, and, and exert influence that way. So um, I'd, I'd point to that as being an important mechanism. And then the last thing to say is, you know, the extent to which um, a bind administration or state governments end up adopting policies that institutionalize and channel that movement energy back into local communities, not in symbolic ways, not in ways that are meant to co-opt the energy, but in ways that are meant to create feedback loops that reinforce that movement energy. And I think about, for instance, the opportunity that we had around the war on poverty with the Office of Economic Opportunity um, that was for a brief moment contemplating giving um, ownership and, and financial direction of federal um, social supports to local community organizations led by um, by activists of color to direct those resources in, in, um, in the neighborhoods and the communities where they lived. And I wonder if there's a possibility thinking about an economic recovery bill that a Biden administration would be contemplating, whether or not there's an opportunity for thinking about giving that kind of local autonomy and support to these communities of color. That's tremendous. I hadn't thought about the idea that the, the, the Tea Party's mobilizational strategy may prove modular, maybe something that the Black Lives Matter can really exploit and learn from. Uh, that's a fascinating idea. Um, uh, we'll turn now to Julia. Yeah, great. So, um, so Alex and Leah have really addressed the federalism component. So I can talk about a couple of other a, a couple other things. And I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of the the structure of the Democratic Party, the internal dynamics of the Democratic Party, and Joe Biden's kind of place within it all. And one thing that I've been thinking about since this summer is about the complexity of, of the coalitions within the Democratic Party and the different dimensions of of intra-party disagreement and, and particularly the complexity of black politics within the Democratic Party. You actually saw some kind of forerunners of this in 2016 when you had among voters heavy African-American support for Hillary Clinton and among kind of prominent black intellectuals of the left, a lot of support for Bernie Sanders. I think you kind of see a similar um, a similar dynamic in 2020 where Joe Biden, I think really owes his nomination to leaders like Jim Clyburn in South Carolina and to African-American voters within the Democratic electorate, particularly, um, particularly older African-American voters. I think there's an age difference there. So we have all these dimensionality of, all these dimensions of, of party, <laughs> intra-party um, disagreement. But at the same time, while that is a kind of center-left coalition and a pragmatic coalition, I don't want to suggest Black Lives Matter isn't pragmatic, but it is, I think, you know, clearly a movement of the left. And it's not just a movement, its platform is not just a, about the police, right? It's not just about incarceration, it's also about economic justice. It's also decidedly an economically left movement. And so I think that's, that makes for a lot of interesting kinds of, of dynamics within the Democratic Party. It's hard to know, I think, how that will play out without knowing I mean, if a Biden presidency is even going to be a thing, um, and what Congress will look like, um, and a couple of other factors. And I think I think it's important to note simply that, well, I, I think very much these dynamics of neutralizing a radical movement are absolutely kind of almost intrinsically part of the party process, that we do see some shifts in the terms of debate. And that the kind of transformation and transformational change, I think that a lot of folks are looking for through social movements and also potentially through a new democratic administration, those transformational politics unfold very slowly. And they begin with a change in the terms of debate. And you, you do start to see that where in the mainstream now in polls, people are asking about defunding the police. People are asking questions, speaking to other kinds of social movements about abolishing ICE. These were not questions on the agenda. This was not part of the conversation a few years ago. So I do think we see this kind of movement, even though it's not exactly the kind of, the kind of candidacy I think Joe Biden thought he was going to be, um, you know, going to be having. And I think that's, that's kind of the additional factor. And I've written a little bit about this at Mistress of Faction, the, 
the blog I write for that Tom mentioned in the beginning about how Biden might be responsive to social movements within the party that he is not really, you know, a part of or necessarily very close to. Um, and I think that that's going to depend on, it's going to depend on the structure of, of who is, you know, who has, who has power and influence over Biden, who are the different people, who are some of the personnel um, that he appoints within, um, within the White House and how he may, how he strikes those kinds of balances. Those things I think are really critically important to thinking about the relationship between presidents and social movements is who is, who is the president's gatekeeper? Who is the chief of staff? Um, who are the kinds of liaisons that he might appoint to address some of these issues, including intergovernmental um, positions within the White House. But also, and this speaks to the work that I've done in the past, I think it'll really matter how Biden and the people around him and the country at large end up interpreting the election result in the event of a Biden victory. If the idea behind a Biden election result is look at this energy, this movement, younger people, the dependence on these kinds of social movements calling for change, if that narrative takes a hold, then I think that's an opportunity for those movements to, to push. If Biden and the people around him are really convinced this is your core constituency, this is why you won, these are the people you owe your presidency to. Um, and alternately, I think there are, there are other kinds of interpretations of a potential Biden victory. Um, and one of them, you know, one of them is is much more rooted in this um, in this idea of, of returning to normalcy and the center left. So I think kind of ideology, social movements, and race all working together in interesting ways. Oh man, there's so much politics that we don't even know about, um, and this is all speculative because it depends on results of an election that hasn't even happened yet. Um, I want to take this opportunity from to move from speaking about the internal complexity of the Democratic Party coalition to, to speaking more about the internal complexity of the Republican Party coalition at the moment. And this is a question that we're going to start with Alex, then we'll move to Leah and then to Julia uh, uh, after, um, which is to say that you know, we, we spoke just now about the, the differences between um, the sort of more progressive wing of the Democratic Party and a more moderate, uh, or so what I think of in my mind is the suburban, uh, the white suburban understanding of the Democratic Party. Um, I'm also quite interested though about, uh, Alex, your insights on the way that big business has been resh reshaping the conservative movement. And what I see is a, a really, you know, it seems to me a contradiction between the, the interests of big business in terms of rate writing regulations that, in, uh, uh, that go for protecting shareholder value or increasing corporate profitabil profitability um, and, the, and the real you know, stark Trumpian brand of nationalist conservatism, which focuses a lot on race, on identity, on immigration, and which is not particularly uh, characterized by well-functioning or stable um, economic policy platforms. How can these things um, go together and how should we think about them in the event that the, that the, the, the Trump campaign emerges victorious? in a couple of days. I think it's a contradiction that is only a contradiction on its face, that on the one hand, you have these large businesses that are supporting Republican candidates and that are preferring policies that would uh, be mainly on the economic side of the ledger. Um, and then on the other hand, you have this candidate who um, more so than, than other Republican candidates in recent years has made race, um, national identity, such a key part of his platform. And I say that it's not such a contradiction because at the end of the day, Although the Trump administration is pursuing some agenda items, particularly around trade and some immigration um, that businesses are not on board with, for the, for the vast majority of the policy priorities of business, they're getting them met through the Trump administration. And I think we only have to look, for instance, at the major legislative priorities of the Trump administration, which have focused on large scale dramatic tax cuts to wealthy individuals and to businesses, um, and uh, the attempted repeal of the Affordable Care Act, which would have provided enormous returns to, um, to wealthy individuals. Um, and on the regulatory side, I think you've seen even more activity, particularly on labor issues and environmental issues where the Trump administration has pursued 
um, even more than what a, what a normal Republican administration might do in terms of deregulation. Um, I'll just give you one concrete example. The number of OSHA inspectors going into the COVID crisis was at a historic low point, um, and that was a result of deliberate choices by the Trump administration not to, to, to hire new inspectors or replace retiring or, or, or departing ones. Um, and that's a specific demand that the business community made, that the Chamber of Commerce put enormous pressure on the Trump administration to, um, to complete. And so so at the end of the day, I think businesses are getting much of what they would have wanted under a Trump administration, even if they have to grimace and put up with his um, his statements that may offend um, uh, the polite company that they keep when it comes to immigrants and to racial and ethnic minorities. Um, the larger question in my mind is not whether capital is going to break from the Republican Party, but whether voters, particularly um, voters who are white, non-college educated, who we might call the white working class, um, who support may have supported Trump because of trade, because of his um, his uh, stances on social programs. You know, Trump was the rare Republican who embraced Medicare and Social Security um, and, and made a pledge to defend those programs um, in the in the primary and then in the general campaign. Whether those voters understand that the agenda that Trump is pursuing on economic policy is not at all aligned with what they wanted. And one area where I'm especially interested to focus on is uh, labor union members. Um, in the last election, Trump uh, attracted a, a, a disproportionate share of labor of labor voters. I think um, almost as many um, are, as, um, as President Ronald Reagan received in, in his election. So my, the question in my mind is whether those working class members of the labor movement understand the deregulatory agenda and just uh, just the price that they that they and other folks have paid um, and whether they change their vote accordingly. Great. We'll, we'll turn next to Leah for your, your thoughts on this question. And I'm also thinking in mind, uh, keeping in mind the work you've done on Black Republicans and this other sort of hidden side or sort of not as widely remarked upon side of a potential coalition that the Republican Party could embrace. Sure. And so I'm, I'm going to keep my remarks narrowed to this idea of this, of essentially a coalition, a this the idea of an emerging coalition that would include black voters. So I want to be clear that any coalition that would emerge on the Republican side that included black voters would be primarily uh, made up of black men because black women do not vote Republican. Uh, they, if they do vote Republican, in the rare case that they do vote Republican, it's a very, very tiny number. Like it's statistically within the margin of error. Um, and we saw that in 2016 and we will most likely see something similar in 2020. Um, so Black uh, uh, Republicans have been, have largely, by and large, been men. Um, and then the other part of this, though, is that it would probably within be within the range of what we've seen over the last 60 or some odd years. So that number hasn't been greater than 18%. It's also been as low as 4%. So anything within that range is very much normal. Um, without doing a lot of effort. So with that said, I think part of what is emerging is this idea that uh, Republicans can win or cut off, siphon off a portion of these Black voters by going after and attracting Black men. Um, but the way to do it, right, if, if they're serious about this idea of moving beyond, say, this 14 to 18 uh, percent uh, uh, number, would actually be by introducing some kind of radical transformative policy along the lines of what we saw in with the New Deal. And since more likely that isn't coming, what you'll see are these kind of piecemeal, again, superficial, public-facing, uh, public relations events that are designed not simply to kind of, again, siphon off these votes here and there, what we pick up would be good, but also to depress turnout. So essentially to drive African-Americans away from uh, the Democratic Party. One thing that I will say that Republicans have picked up on, and it, it, it doesn't, well, actually now it appears that, that Democrats are beginning to pick up on this, is that because Black men seem to be more receptive, again, a very, very small percentage of Black men, but that small percentage of Black men appear to be more receptive than Black women to Republican overtures, we're seeing lots of, um, uh, again, service level efforts, outreach efforts designed to, again, siphon off these votes and build that coalition. That's where there is actually actually opportunity. And I will say that that opportunity comes from really two areas. The first is Black men's belief that political institutions have failed them. Right? So they believe that both political parties have not done a good job and or are ignoring them or indifferent to them. The second 
is this belief amongst a small group of black men that political institutions are racist across the board. So fundamentally that there's no difference, and I'm not saying that this is true, but fundamentally the belief is that there's no difference between the Democratic Party's brand of racism and the Republican Party's brand of racism. So that makes them more receptive to independent politics, but it also makes them slightly more uh, receptive to democratic politics, I, I mean, to Republican politics. So what we're seeing is that if there is to be a coalition to be built, it's going to come from that space. And that explains a lot of why the Republican Party recently has kind of ramped up these efforts that are very much geared towards attracting the small subset of Black men who might be receptive to these overtures. Thank you, Leah. Uh, before I turn this over to Julia with a sort of a, a curveball on the version of the question that we were just talking about, I want to remind the, those of you who are at home listening along to our webinar, please, please submit your questions using the Q&A function there. We've accumulated about 14 and we're, um, and we're going to be putting them in the queue. And so we'd love to hear from you. Um, Julia, so continuing on this theme of how do we make sense of the disparate you know, it seems to some of us to be very disparate uh, 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 interest factions that are supporting the Republican Party at the moment. Um, it's commonly said that political scientists want strong parties, but uh, all, everybody else doesn't. That Americans are generally unhappy with their political parties, want them to be different or unsatisfied with the way they're constituted. And that many times polit political scientists respond that if our parties were just stronger, and more able to rein in the sort of factionalism and set the agenda rather than being driven by uh, uh, factional interests that uh, our politics would be more organized. And I wonder if you can speak to that knowing your expertise on, on parties as well. Yeah, thank you. So I think, um, I think yeah, it's, it's tricky. And I kind of wanted to address the, um, the original question and I think amplify what, what Alex and Leah have kind of said about the, the relationship between politics and policy within the Republican Party, which is I think the, the fate of Trumpism will be dependent on the degree to which Republicans can kind of run on one set of, of beliefs and promises, which Trump kind of did in 2016, moving to the, the left on policy, on economic policy issues specifically, and then governed in a completely different way. Um, to the extent that that, that that is a sustainable strategy, then Trumpism can stumble on and on and on. And this is related to your question because it, it's, it's related to the, the question of how, like, what tools do parties have at their disposal to kind of bring together and keep together these different coalitions. And that's, I think, you know, for, for the Republican Party in particular, it has been these kind of ideological and identity-based appeals. And that's not to suggest that the, those are not important to Democrats, but we, we have substantial research in political science to suggest that these are asymmetrical. Um, to answer your question about, you know, political scientists think parties should be stronger. Um, this, is a, this is a tricky one. I think I actually fall out from um, other Americanists who study political parties because there tends to be a strong emphasis on on kind of centralization and if parties just had stronger and more centralized organizations like you said they could kind of set the agenda they could be better gatekeepers and I actually think that the opposite to some degree the opposite is true obviously there's there are some kind of quality control issues with um with candidates and that's always going to be at odds with um with access to the process and so you know, that's, that's one issue. But actually what parties are intended to do and what party, what I'll call party machinery, what party rules um, should be able to do, I think is to bring together these kinds of disparate coalitions and to, and to make room for lots of different kinds of, um, lots of different kinds of interests. This is a lot easier to talk about when you're talking about whichever party doesn't have the segment of the American electorate that's very motivated by racial animus and, and increasingly anti-immigration sentiment. That segment has always been with us. Um, that segment is not confined to a geographical area in the country, but is, is most competitive in, in the South. Um, and we watch, you know, if we look at party history, we see how the Democrats dealt with that, which was with this kind of party machinery. Um, and you had kind of broader social norms that allowed them to make concessions to that to that wing of the party. That wing of the Democratic Party has migrated into the Republican Party. 
And I think that one, one development that's happened and one development where the, where the emergence of Trumpism was kind of a gift to Republican establishment elites is that it allowed them to separate themselves from those sentiments and cast that as outsider kind of these, these are coming from somewhere else and at the same time capitalize on that electoral support. So there's kind of one conversation about how can we strengthen parties so they're better at, at being mosaic coalitions of different interests. And that does, I think, get to some of the questions about, about actually polarization, right? About how parties then can be better at representing all different kinds of groups and potentially bring groups in. Um, that's one question. But then you start thinking about who these, who these groups are, right? What are, the, what are the tiles in this mosaic? And one of them is the kind of xenophobic racist tile. Um, I did not plan this tile metaphor, and I am sorry. Um, but the, you know, the. I think that's kind of if we if we recast the story of American party politics as being about how how the parties deal with this faction um, and how changing social norms and changing political environment shapes that, we actually have a very different set of questions about intra-party politics. I don't know if that answers anything that you asked me, but that those are my thoughts. Absolutely, it does. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn now to the part of the program where we take uh, questions from the audience. And we've got a nice little queue going, but we welcome more. Um, please send them in. Um, uh, we'll start here uh, with a question from Jeff Applegate. To what extent have identity elements replaced issue elements or ideology in driving polarization? And he means not just in racial terms, but religious, urban versus rural, or simply partisan identity, the plural, uh, you know, who are the deplorables and who just wants to own the libs? It seems that ideologies are more fluid and in favor of winning for one's team. In this sort of world, what is the tail and which is the dog nowadays? Um, uh, Leah, do you want to take a, a first stab at this? I definitely want to take a stab at this, but I did see that Alex had wanted to piggyback on something that Julia said. So I want to jump back to him for a second, if that's okay. <laughs> Not to take us in a, in a different direction. I just wanted to um, follow up on, on Julia's great intervention about whether or not we would prefer stronger parties and what to do when there is a strong contingent within one or both of the parties that is bent on racial exclusion. And I, I would say, in addition to everything that Julia said, I think a lot of it depends on the structure of our political institutions and the incentives that those institutions give to the parties um, to reach out to certain voters or not, to pass legislation or not. And I think we're in a toxic mix where we have parties that are, are poorly equipped to manage the cleavages that they have, particularly on the Republican side, coupled with incentives that are given by the political institutions we have for the Republicans to double down on the kind of racially exclusionary identity-based appeals that Julia was just talking about and that Jeff has raised in his question. And that's because they're, the Republican Party and, and Republican politicians feel that they cannot win um, based on their current composition of their, of their coalition um, if they have to appeal to majorities of voters, which is why you're seeing such strong support uh, in the Republican Party for measures that would restrict the franchise um, as we're seeing on a daily basis right now um, at the state level and at the federal level. And so I think it's, a, it's this toxic mix of our, our, our minoritarian political institutions that are allowing the Republican Party um, and, and reinforcing, uh, re allowing the Republican Party to double down on these racially exclusionary appeals and creating strong incentives for them to do so. Excellent, thank you. Um, over to you, Leah. Do you have a, oh, let's see. Sure, I, I just wanna kind of jump on and just add something quickly. And it's more so me thinking through a couple of things. And I wonder if, you know, for a very long time, there was this kind of idea that identity politics was something that Democrats did, right? That this was something that, you know, we see identitarian politics is something on the left, right? And, and But it feels a lot like that's not so much the case now. And that particularly one of, you know, one of Trump's main appeals, and I think this is part of Alex's point, has been roping in this idea of identity politics and applying it to the Republican Party, particularly in areas where Republicans once were, you know, pardon the pun, gun shy on a number of these identity issues, or at least gun shy about using them in a public forum, right? Or using them explicitly, explicit appeals to these things. 
With that said, I do think that, you know, there's a way in which some of these identity issues that we talk about can't be separated from the issue, can't be teased out. So, you know, I'm thinking about things like abortion and religion, and we haven't really necessarily talked a lot about abortion during this conversation, and I would welcome questions from, you know, the audience, but how that's intrinsically tied to religion and it's intrinsically tied to identity in a lot of cases in the same way that say perhaps um, race and uh, race and pro-choice identity is tied to, you know, tied to the left in some um, in some respects. Um, I'm also thinking about how we imagine immigration and the conversation around immigration, that that's not simply an issues-based conversation, but it's also an identity-based conversation that a number that, that um, that people have managed to form coalitions around, particularly in this moment of, you know, social movements and propelling political ideas to the forefront of, you know, of the party. And so one thing that I'll think about is that, that I want to leave you guys with on this question, is to think about a figure like Steve Bannon, who has, you know, comes and goes in and out of the political realm, the mainstream of the political realm. But one of the things that he said very early on, I believe 2011, was that issues and identity, particularly on the on the right, were intrinsically linked, and that the two couldn't be divorced, and that it would be important moving forward to have a candidate and to have a party infrastructure that understood that and could exploit it, right? And so picking up on kind of ideas that were percolating in the grassroots of the Republican Party and managing to essentially lasso that and use it as part of political momentum going forward. Excellent. Uh, Julia, Alex, you want to jump in on this question? I, um, I guess I would all I'd add to, to Leah's great intervention is that um, what we know from political science research is that these identities don't come out of thin air, that they're nurtured, cultivated, and disseminated by political organizations, by social movements. And so the ability of the Republican Party and of Trump to be making these racially exclusionary appeals to various constituencies of, of white voters depends very heavily on intermediary organizations like the National Rifle Association, we know, for instance, has propagated a very specific identity around white male gun ownership, racially exclusionary, or religious conservative groups were, were focused on abortion, for instance. And so to the extent that we're thinking about where these identities come from and how they're channeled, I think we need to be thinking very centrally about these intermediary organizations that are present within both of the parties. Julia? I'll just briefly say that I think the other part of this identity question actually links up to what I was saying earlier about crisis and that these, these moments when people are really feeling kind of insecure and pressed by, by economic issues, by health issues, or by a feeling of, of sense of threat in the national security arena, these all, I think, exacerbate the, the kind of tension around identities and the ways in which people feel like their identity, their status is, is under threat and make them more receptive and to make the political environment broadly more receptive to these kinds of appeals that, that Alex was talking about. So the next question uh, is open to any of the three uh, panelists as well, and it sort of continues on this theme a little bit. And it's a question from Jennifer St. Soum. Can we comment on the role of women in this election, particularly across different racial groups? How is each candidate approaching this constituency? How would you describe the strengths and weaknesses of each candidate in their approach? Finally, how do we link these trends to electoral outcomes? Anybody want to take a uh, first stab at that one? We're, I guess we're, we're sort of sorely lacking in um, a person with, with primary expertise in gender here. I don't know if either of you have, uh, or have side projects on gender, I don't. Um, but um, I've been kind of thinking about um, thinking about the kind of presidential candidate appeals and also thinking about how these different groups intersect. And that's something, if we're talking about, if we're talking about women in the electorate, that's something that I think has kind of become one of the, the key points of interpretation of the 2016 election was like, on the one hand, the resistance to the Trump presidency has really been rooted in gender identity. And on the other hand, that's been kind of challenged by the role of race right so i remember like the the women's march in 2017 and people out with with signs and wearing hats and then the signs saying white women voted for trump and those things are true and yet there's also a gender gap 
among white voters. And there's also a gender gap when you break down white voters um, into college and non-college, there's still a gender gap. Um, so I think that's, I think that's really complex. Um, and that, those are some of the questions I've been thinking about. And then this sort of new Trump thing about appealing to suburban women and most recently saying that um, he's gonna put your, your husbands back to work and the ways in which that, that landed. Um, you know, I think there is, there's a lot of work to be done there. And obviously those types of tropes are informing how the candidates approach the election. Um, but I also think gender is among the other, among other identity topics tends to be very complex because it cuts across so many other social identities. So I, I can jump here in here and say that I think there is a stark difference in, in how the two major political parties are addressing gender issues. And I'll start with the Democratic Party. One of the things, one of the, the significant shifts that we've seen over the past at least five years is an acknowledgement, a public acknowledgement that Black women make up the backbone of the modern Democratic Party, that they are the most consistent and the most loyal um, uh, participants. And so on the one hand, I think very early on, we saw very um, almost high level um, uh, front facing appeals to that very idea. But at the same time, one of the things that we, we saw come out of that is that Black women in poll after poll and survey after survey said that while they felt enthusiasm and support from the Democratic Party, they felt like their policy issues weren't being addressed. So they felt like the Democratic Party could say very clearly intersectionality, but that when it came time for an agenda, when it came time for policy, that that intersectionality wasn't being addressed. What we saw, I think, was a course correction of that in some regard with the president, the Democratic presidential candidates in 2020, in particular, Elizabeth Warren, who very came out very early and, in fact, kind of led the pack and, and influenced a number of the other presidential candidates in saying, this is how we are going to directly target and speak to our base in the same way that Republicans speak to their white evangelical base by giving them the things that they want and that they ask for. And so there was a new negotiation in terms of how do you get access? How do you use electoral politics in order to get the kind of influence and power that you want? So I think we saw a lot of that and we've seen similar kinds of conversations around other kind of, uh, you know, I hate to use the term, but other marginalized groups who make up the base of the Dem uh, Democratic Party with regard to women. So we've seen outreach, significant policy and outreach efforts to those groups. Although I think we can all argue that they should do more. So these are the kind of the appeals. The Republican Party has taken a very different approach by using the idea of gender to talk to both this idea of the pursuit of this kind of, you know, um, amorphous uh, white suburban woman, right? And so using these ideas about housing policy, immigration policy, um, you know, the, the Trump's angels, I can't remember the, the correct term, tend to be in, this is the uh, idea of women who have lost their children to um, uh, undocumented individual violence, right? Using them front and center in uh, as kind of a contrast to mothers of the movement, which is what the Democratic Party has been using in this respect. Um, and also the idea around, um, you know, uh, anti-abortion, pro-life movement, using that in a gendered frame, uh, using that in a gendered frame. The one thing that I will say, however, that I think has gone under the radar are appeals to um, uh, Latino women um, from the Republican Party through the lens of conservatism and religion. And that the Republican Party has a track record of doing that and they're continuing in that track record. And a lot of attention has been paid to that because so much attention has been paid to the role of white women in attracting, doing outreach efforts to white women, white suburban women within the Republican Party. So I would argue that that's another area that's worthy of exploration. Um, the only thing I'd add quickly is teeing off of Leah's points is that I think the a future Biden administration has a moment to address some of these issues, the issues of intersectionality in a really concrete and tangible way, given how the COVID crisis has hit Latinx um, uh, workers and disproportionately women um, in the Latina population, African American women as well, so hard in both in terms of the health risk and the unemployment risk. And so, in thinking about an economic recovery package that they might pass, there you know ways in which you might center those communities in particular and ensure that they're receiving um, a, a disproportionate share of the benefits. Um, so it's a substantive way that I would look out for for how the Democratic Party is thinking about these populations going forward. We're going to shift gears a little bit in the next question. Um, this, this one comes from Sid Terrell. Uh, 
Can any of the panelists talk about what is likely to happen to the extreme and violent elements on the fringe of the Trumpian movement should Trump lose big on Tuesday? Will it crawl back into its hole after Trump or reshape into a coherent political faction? Who'd like to take first stab at this one? I can take a quick early stab at this, which is to say I'm part of you know team pessimism, which is to suggest that were Trump to lose, that this element is not going anywhere. And I think part of the way, part of how I come up with that, that argument is by suggesting that Trump is not the cause of these groups. He may have exacerbated, he may have accelerated them, he may have you know, brought them into the mainstream perhaps, but that those fringe elements of, you know, of the right have been there and exist through institutions that exist beyond just the Republican party. And so I think one of the things that, that has struck me is that we can trace a very long line of history, right? And, and Kathleen uh, Ballou has a really wonderful uh, book called Bringing the War Home that is essentially about this, that suggests that it has more to do with kind of militarization and the return uh, uh, and the way in which um, white men are socialized within this country um, and their proximity to, and their proximity and lack of access to not just resources, right, because in some cases it's not about economic insecurity, but also about kind of a cultural feeling, a, a feeling of cultural insecurity. And so those things persist irrespective of Trump. And I would just point to the incident in Michigan that the, you know, the FBI foiling that plot against the governor of Michigan and how so much of that sentiment that we saw in the papers that are coming out are anti-governmental se sentiment, right? So they, yes, they are tied to polarization and partisanship and say identifying with, with Donald Trump, but they also exist outside of that binary that we're trying to put on it. So with that being said, I think they continue even if in the event that Trump uh, loses, uh, loses the election. I guess I would go back to my earlier point about the incentives faced by the Republican Party given our current political institutions. And to the extent that the Republican Party feels as though they cannot win majority elections at the national level, at the state level, and can get away with minoritarian changes in these institutions, whether it's gerrymandering, whether it's um, relying heavily on a judiciary that's willing to limit voting rights, whether it's restricting access to the franchise or, or voter registration, to the extent that they can get away with those strategies, I think it encourages them to continue making these kinds of appeals that Trump um, put out in the open so clearly in future elections. Um, it, it would be hard to think of, of rational Republican politicians not taking advantage of that latent um, uh, political uh, uh, ammunition that's available to them. And so that's why I think it'll be so critical um, to the extent that we want to reduce the, the extent that the, the Republican Party relies on these appeals to change the incentives by changing the institutions and forcing the Republican Party to compete for votes all over the country from, from across very different populations. I just want to add something briefly, which is, is the, and this is really, these groups are kind of out of my area of expertise, but I do remember them being, you know, obviously part of the conversation in the 1990s, right? This is like these kinds of fringe militia groups have been around for a long time and have done some pretty substantial damage. But as Leah said, we're kind of seen as separate from, um, from the, you know, from the partisan politics. And so one question is the degree to which, as, as Alex alluded to, that that Republican elites might have an incentive to try and, um, you know, keep these groups somehow related to their coalition or have other incentives to, um, to do other things. But the other question I think is, is whether there's kind of a bright line between these types of groups and groups that are mobilized around ideas of, of toxic masculinity that are mobilized around you know racial animus like whether there's a bright line there or whether we're looking at a continuum and I think that I don't know the answer to that question but I think that leads us again in kind of different directions as far as how we would address what needs to be done moving forward. Thanks everybody uh, we've got about 10 minutes left and I've got a bunch of questions I want to get through so um, uh, I'll just, I'll fire off one and, and we can, uh, uh, we can uh, take your responses. This one comes from Daniel Maffei. Uh, engagement in local politics in hopes that the movement might trickle up to Washington ignores the geography of political views. Uh, 
and the US Constitution's bias towards less populated states. I'm concerned that it will just add to polarization and further weaken the Democrats' ability to develop new leaders who can appeal, appeal more broadly to both parties on a truly national stage. Am I wrong? Anybody feel like taking a stab at that, that one? That seems like such an Alex question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm happy happy to um, to weigh in. I mean, my sense is that um, it it is true that um, that the political institutions in this country certainly bias from an electoral perspective away from more urban areas um, towards more rural ones, and we're seeing you know, the partisan effects of that in this cycle certainly. But that's not to say that within a party that forces that exist, movements that exist that are rooted within um, metropolitan areas within uh, more densely populated states can't have um, an impact. And I would point to, for instance, um, you know, the rise of, of, of AOC here in New York, who um, is changing in, in some ways that the center of gravity within some parts of the Democratic Party, certainly conversations about the design of, of policy. But ultimately, I think if you want to be a national movement um, and, and, and have a national presence, you're going to have to be rooted elsewhere, elsewhere in the country. But I think it is possible to have, uh, to have a, an effect on the agenda setting of a party, even, even if you're operating within some of these densely populated areas. Leah or Julia, do you want to take a stab at this one? Okay, we've got some more here. Um, this question comes from Ryan La Rochelle. What can some of the movements who have struggled to anchor or force change within parties, such as Occupy or maybe Black Lives Matter, learn from those that successfully did transform parties in the past, such as the Labour and, and the Democratic Party of the 1930s or the Christian right in the GOP? Um, uh, and a related question, um, will the indivisible and related groups that have been established since 2016 force change within the Democratic Party or will they try to avoid such a marriage? This is, I think, comparable to the question about Black Lives Matter we heard before. So I can jump in on this quickly um, before hearing, I would, Julia, I actually would love to hear your take on the like political party angle of this. But I think one of the things that we can take away or learn from some of the successes of these other movements is the amount of time and the length of time that has happened in terms of investment. So we tend to think of you know, change or we tend to recognize change when it happens in front of us, particularly when it's successful. What we don't look at is the longer overarching, and I could be biased because I'm a historian by training, but we don't look at this you know, longer overarching sentiment and we don't look at the failures. So when we see the Christian right, and we see the victories that we that they have, uh, particularly the legislative victories. One of the things that we don't recognize is that the Christian right, when we look at their victories, that this has been 40, 50 years in the making, that it, it doesn't happen suddenly, that you know, the emphasis on the courts is something that comes out of failure in terms of being able to push their appeal through, say, the executive branch or through the congressional or legislative branch. So they focus, so they end up focusing on the courts. I think this is too tr also true in terms of, say, something like the labor movement. You know, when we begin to see these various victories across the 20th century within the labor movement, these are long-term things. When we look at the civil rights movement and we look at the process around these things, again, this is a 40, 50, 60, in some cases, 67 year fight. And that and one that doesn't actually, you know, really necessarily fix the idea that people are after. So I, I wanna emphasize that uh, change over time is really important, but then also the long lasting commitment to these those issues. So just to end on, on one point here, I don't think that we should be looking right now at Occupy or even Black Lives Matter to suggest that there will be immediate victories in, in this, you know, in the immediate future. That in fact, what we should be looking at and what they should be kind of modeling right now is how to bounce back from failure and then also how to project out for 20 to 30 years, right? Like how do you play the long game in terms of policy and success? Alex or Julia? Okay, sorry, I kind of I kind of jumped on the mute button because I'm <laughs> excited about this question. Um, I think that there's so I think the answer I'm going to have is going to be really unsatisfying though, 
Um, and that is that it, I think the lessons to be learned from these types of movements, specifically the ones that, that Ryan mentioned in his question, Occupy and Black Lives Matter, which are kind of movements of movements of, of fundamental ideological and institutional transformation. The case in the Schlossman books, so this is uh, when, when movements anchor parties, um, that you want to actually look at is not labor in the Democratic Party, and it's not the Christian right in the De and the Republican Party, it's abolition and the formation of the Republican Party. I think that's the that's the kind of analog. And that's one of the sort of cases that was that Schlossman describes as fundamentally being less successful. And I think there we have we have a couple of we have one development and we have one intrinsic tension. And I think we have a development which is just simply parties as organizations developing over, over the years. And the fact that our two political parties are quite old um, and are quite kind of set in a lot of their institutional ways and, and the approaches that they have in the constituencies that they have, um, as well as in some of their personnel and their personnel networks. So I think you're sort of looking at a different a different situation in the 21st century than you were at some of these earlier points in time. Um, the other thing that I think is um, that I think is more intrinsic and less specific to the moment is that there is a tension between being a political party, which is kind of and Leah was alluding to this earlier, talking about the tension between liberal um, liberalism and a more kind of movement oriented thing like Black Lives Matter, which is which is that I think political parties are kind of fundamentally conservative institutions. They want to keep their coalitions. They have they have power structures that take on a life of their own. Um, and that's not compatible with revolutionary transformative movements all the time. That doesn't mean that they can't work together, right? It doesn't mean there's not influence. But I do think that that's the lens to look through. And like, if you are thinking about those things, the abolition chapter is the chapter of the Schlossman book to read, which is a great book and I highly recommend. It's a great question. Endorsing everything that uh, that Julia just said, including the endorsement of, of Danny's great book, I would just say, I think the case of labor within the Democratic Party illustrates some uh, some fundamental differences between the party and how they between the Democratic and the Republic coalition and the parties in, in terms of how they think about power. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that the Republican Party and especially some wings of the conservative movement have been much better at thinking about how to bridge um, differences that they might have to focus on moves in policy that reinforce power like attacking labor unions. I mean, I think it's so striking that you can get the Christian right and libertarian groups and big business to all focus on, for instance, one goal, which is to um, defeat the power of labor. Whereas on the Democratic Party side, how often do you have environmental groups or reproductive rights groups saying, what we need to do is strengthen the labor movement? Or how often do you have labor unions saying, what we need to do is strengthen these other, these other segments of the Democratic Party coalition? And I think that question of coalition management and its relationship to policy design and prioritization um, is really striking, particularly when you think about the failure of some parts of the Democratic Party coalition to, to establish more of a foothold and, and especially labor. Thanks, everybody. This is going to be our last question. It's been a really exciting and really interesting and stimulating conversation so far. And so uh, I know that we've got enough questions in the queue to keep us occupied for another uh, hour and 15. Um, but we'll we'll close it off with this one, um, which it comes from from anonymous, but not that one. Can the current relatively drastic polarization be overcome by a deliberate political strategy, or do we have to wait for future crises to force both sides to revise or set aside their core values? Maybe I'll I'll start in the order we began. We'll start with Julia. Yeah, so I mean, I think that future crises are likely to make it worse. So deliberate political strategy would um, would, would be the way to go. Um, I don't know what you know. Finding people who have those kinds of incentives are that that's the tricky part. Um, but finding kind of national goals and ideas and values and symbols that we can all share, I think that's that's a project worth engaging. That's a, that's that's a good point. Let's score one for deliberate strategy. Looks around, sees crisis, and look where we are. Um, uh, uh, next, your thoughts, Alex, please. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, I think that the crisis could present an opportunity for coming together. And I think about the possibility for the construction of something like a national health security core, where you'd have some form of national service, where we would all, to the extent that we're capable, work together to try and um, defeat the, the COVID pandemic. And it could be a way of um, bridging communities that previously did not come together. So I think that's, uh, that's the sort of scale of, of intervention that I would hope for to, to construct a more coherent identity. But I think in the short run, institutional reforms that change the incentives of the parties and especially the Republican party have to be front and center. Thanks, Alex. Leah, the last word is yours. Sure. So aliens coming down from outer space, perhaps, right? <laughs> perhaps. But I say this and I say this in response to the idea that, you know, we have seen these moments of crisis and we're experiencing a moment of crisis right now, a moment of crisis that should have pushed us, I think, in the direction of reducing polarization. And what we saw is exactly the opposite, that it's become polarized, it's become political, it's become, you know, partisan. And so I really wonder about what is the kind of crisis, what is the kind of overwhelming crisis that allows people to kind of, to, to move beyond polarization as a fact. Um, but, you know, in the short term, again, I think it's these, these moments of, again, as, as Julia and Alex mention of incentivi incentivizing right reasons and ideas to for people not to be polarized and i think particularly one perhaps area to to do it and one area that we've seen that could be productive is around an issue like mass incarceration and not i'm not going to say police reform because that's clearly not it but something like mass incarceration where there is right now a very very fragile consensus um, and bipartisan consensus allows us perhaps to move in a direction that, you know, that where we could be, you know, we could be productive in terms of moving to a new place. Thank you very much, Leah. And thanks to everybody for your participation today. Those of you watching along at home, uh, your engagement has been fantastic. We're sorry for all the questions we couldn't take, but obviously we've got a lot more to talk about and it's only gonna get more interesting next week. Um, so I'd like to, uh, before signing off, um, uh, direct your attention to our next scheduled uh, American Democracy Collaborative Democracy 2020 webinar, which will be entitled Post-Election Assessment, the Future of American Democracy. This is on the schedule for Friday, December 4th at 2 p.m., so same time, same station. Um, our panelists will be Francis Lee of Princeton University, Christopher Parker of the University of Washington, and Paul Pearson from the University of California at Berkeley, and will be moderated by uh, Johns Hopkins' uh, own Robert Lieberman. Um, thanks everybody uh, for the fantastic uh, discussion. Thanks again to the panelists, Leah, Alex, and Julia for their incredible insights and their thought-provoking commentary. Um, stay safe over the weekend, everybody, and we'll see you soon.